Dr. Rajat, welcome to this special session of the Jaipur Dialogues. Uh, I just came to know that you are writing, the, you have written this new book, which is a refutation of the Aryan race conjecture. Uh, I hope it's visible on the screen, yes. So, uh, I, I know that you, you, you are a renowned scholar in a variety of fields. You've done a lot of research in a variety of fields, as we all know. I wasn't aware that you were working on this particular topic. So, could you please tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, it is uh, basically uh, an issue, uh, firstly, about race. Yes. Secondly, it's an issue about mathematics, arithmetic. And, uh, well, thirdly, it's an issue about uh, Greek glorification. Mm -hmm. So let's take these issues one at a time. Right. So uh, the first issue that we have about, well, let's start with maybe the arithmetic part. Okay. So one of the statements that is made is that uh, Aryans came to India and it was they who created the Ved, mm -hmm. right? And they drove off the Dasas and they, they became the Dravidians. So it is, it creates a regional divide, which was a policy of the British to create such a divide and rule because they were militarily weak. Mm -hmm. They wanted soft power in order to be able to rule. They ruled with the help of Indians. Mm -hmm. So they pretended to be liberators from an earlier oppressive rule. Right. Now, uh, the relation to the history of mathematics uh, is this, that uh, if you look at the Rig Ved, you find that the, uh, not the, the Jajur Ved, I'm sorry. Okay. If you look at the Jajur Ved, you find that there are numbers up to 10 to the power 12. Okay. That is Parag. And if you look at uh, this question that I asked yesterday, uh, the question which was asked the Buddha, mm -hmm. can you name the numbers after 100 crores? Okay. And he goes to something like 10 to the power 8. 10 to the power 53 is the Tallakshan and it goes on like that. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very huge number. Yes. And now remember we are talking about who wrote the Ved. So in contrast, see what is the Aryan race conjecture that your three languages, well four languages actually, you have Greek, you have Latin, you have Sanskrit and in between you have Persian, Farsi mm -hmm. or well Avestan yes. if you like. Okay. So uh, they are similar, they are word similarities, they are grammatical similarities and the question is how did these similarities form? Yes. And the only conjecture which has been put forward is that there must have been a common group of people. That's from the time of William Jones. Now the similarity was observed long before William Jones, but William Jones was most apparently troubled by it and wanted to do something about mm. it. Now the question is, Supposing there were really a common origin, mm -hmm. why should only the language be similar? Because there are other requirements of a culture, like you have everyday commerce, so you have to have a similar arithmetic. If I want to carry out everyday commerce, I should be able to engage in the calculations that are involved. Indeed. Then there is a calendar, mm -hmm. which is part of a culture, and that's a more basic part of the culture. For example, you take India. India has so many different languages. But the calendar, and there are variations, regional variations, minor variations. But the South celebrates Diwali on more or less the same day in which the North celebrates Diwali. Mm -hmm. You don't have an Aryan, a Dravidian, or any kind of divide in the calendar. You have different languages. And the same thing is true in Europe, mm -hmm. that you have one calendar, and uh, you have so many different languages. It's like the French and the British may have been warring for a thousand years, yes. but they follow the same calendar. Yes. Right? and uh, Christmas or Easter or whatever festival you have. So those are basic requirements. And therefore, had there been a common origin, then you should have a similar arithmetic yes. and you should have a similar calendar, which is not true. So if you look at arithmetic, the Roman arithmetic or the Greek arithmetic, the biggest number is a myriad, yes. which is 10,000. And uh, now, how could, had there been any Aryans, then 
they how how is it what happened to them after they entered india how did they suddenly go into 10 to the power 80 which is far beyond millions trillions and everything yes indeed hmm? and how come i mean was it that they suddenly became very intelligent when they came to india <laughs> so we are really talking about culture we are not talking about genetics yes. or was it that they became very stupid when they went to europe and they forgot everything so there is a serious issue which has not been addressed because people say it's the domain of the linguist why should it be the domain of the linguist i mean the linguist should be able to answer questions about mathematics if they don't know mathematics that's too bad because linguist i mean uh, linguistic theory is based on a lot of speculations and those speculations are based on authority so how many languages can a person know there are so many languages in india you now you may know four languages five languages that's about uh, i mean normal person will not know more than that yes and uh, how can then you have to really be a specialist you have to spend a lot of time in order to be able to talk about these linguistic similarities right so it becomes a matter of authority right. it's controlled by authority mm -hmm. the speculations controlled by authority whereas if you are talking about arithmetic now there is no authority here. if you are talking about the calendar it's non textual evidence it's not about the text it's not about it's completely uh, you know solid evidence calendar we are using today you can't say this was not the calendar it was the calendar it is still the calendar yes. the gregorian calendar with some minor changes with the change of the length of the year in 1582 and so on but we are still using that calendar all the rest of the defects persist so that non textual evidence is extremely important which has never been taken into account by any of these people mm -hmm. so that's the idea that if you are talking of a common race if you are talking of a common group or a common genetic group then how can it be that they have such completely radically different arithmetic one can't count beyond 10000 and uh, one goes so, so large and now this is a difference of how long see we are talking of yajurved then we are talking of buddh and we are coming to the europe in europe their arithmetic was corrected when they started importing indian arithmetic gerbert started it in the uh, 10th century mm -hmm. he imported it from cordoba and then he couldn't understand it so <laughs> it's not only that they could not invent it they lacked the creativity they could not invent a proper ar efficient arithmetic system but even when it was imported they could not understand it right and now he was not the only person next chap to do it was fibonacci, fibonacci. who yes so fibonacci looks at it now he understood unlike gerbert that indian arithmetic is efficient and that efficiency of the arithmetic gives a comparative advantage in commerce mm -hmm. because he was trading with the arabs in africa mm -hmm. but uh gobert understood place value and fibonacci understood arithmetic but florentines did not understand place value so zero is part of place value right. in roman arithmetic your numerals are additive so if i write x x i then it is 10 plus 10 plus 1 mm -hmm. so if i write 1 2 0 it is not 1 plus 2 plus 0 not summing up the digits yes. so they had a problem what is this zero which has no value in itself adds any amount of value to the preceding number and therefore florence passed a law against zero <laughs> yeah so which was really ridiculous mm -hmm. and we still follow that that anything any contract that is uh, written in uh, uh, those what they called arabic numerals must be written also in words when you write a check you write in words unless you are doing a digital transaction mm -hmm. then now you only do numbers not words yes so the point is they could did not know it they could not i mean they could not create it and even after it was imported they could not understand it and now it's not just zero zero we talk about but zero is associated with negative numbers fibonacci did not understand negative numbers because their system was based on the abacus and on the abacus you can represent zero gerbert represented zero as a blank space but how do you represent negative numbers you can't represent negative numbers so they were completely confused about negative numbers de morgan augustus de morgan who was uh, in, uh, teaching in the university college london he says negative numbers are evil evil <laughs> yeah evil <laughs> <laughs> so i mean <laughs> so just imagine that and uh, he has repeatedly emphasizes in his textbook on arithmetic and on algebra you can only subtract a smaller number from a larger number never a larger number from a smaller number 
repeatedly says it, and those things are quoted here. Yes, so this is now we are talking 19th century. Mm -hmm. And, and he is a sort of crusader for arithmetic and so on. He is the chap who stopped the Indian calculus, by the way. So he said it's all nonsense. But he did not even understand negative numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you have this kind of a situation. We are talking about what? We are talking about the Vedic period where you have people talking. Uh, Ved has got numbers like Parads, which are 10 to the power 12, which are a trillion. Mm -hmm. And you are talking about versus myriad and you are talking about a gap of how many thousands of years, doesn't matter when you date the Ved. Yes. We are talking about the 19th century. They did not understand this arithmetic till then. Right. So how can you say it was a common group which created it? It is complete nonsense. Right. And now what happens is, why was this theory formulated? Because what was the problem? Because the similarities are there in any language. Why was uh, William Jones so upset? Why was Hastings so upset? So this book goes into the background. You know, who were these people? Who, what kind of a person was Hastings? He was a crooked scamster, absolutely horrible. You know, uh, how many Indians he must have killed. Yes. And uh, uh, William Jones was his intellectual lackey. Mm -hmm. So you are talking about these kinds of persons. Why should we trust them? Yes. Right? And it's not just one thing. He talked about Manusmriti and dividing India by caste. And he talked about this, dividing India by region. And Hastings had, after all, the whole idea of Manusmriti was that you must divide India by religion. So you have a division of Muslim law and Hindu law. Mm -hmm. There was no Hindu law earlier. There is a wreath. There is no concept of law. Mm -hmm. So this was the state of affairs that they wanted to divide and rule. So divide, it's a very diverse culture. And so you can have find many fault lines. So fault line along religion, fault line along caste. So Brahmin was a Shudra, fault line was north versus south. And then you build on those fantasies. All right. Now, this was one objective. But why were they upset by the similarity? Because they had glorified the Greeks during the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Right? This is all complete, uh, you know, glory, because during the Crusades, all knowledge, all knowledge which came from captured Arabic texts was attributed to early Greeks. Okay. And much of that, well, some of that knowledge certainly came from India, because Arabs took from India. Yes. It's all attributed to early Greeks, and then they will say, for example, knowledge of astronomy. They'll attribute it to Ptolemy. And what you have is you have an Arab text which is uh, translated into Byzantine Greek. Mm -hmm. And then you say it is Greek, uh, it's early Greek, you confound it. So there are all these kinds of things. So there was glorification of the Greeks that is very central to European culture. Indeed it is. Right? It is yes. very central to that. Yes. So when this idea comes up that, oh, you know, the Greeks must may have just got it, uh, <laughs> Greek language itself may have derived from Sanskrit, mm. it's a catastrophe. It is. A complete, so that they could not face. Mm -hmm. And they have all kinds of, uh, you know, wild imagination about that. Alexander conquered India. Now, where did he conquer India? <laughs> you know, Alexander uh, retreated from the border because uh, he faced one Indian king, Puru, and the elephants and so on, which came into the battle. The Greek soldiers were terrified of it, and they were told there are, you know, 6,000 ele uh, elephants further down. Yes. And this is all recorded in their own history. It's recorded by Plutarch. It is recorded by Arian. Uh, he writes about uh, uh, Alexander, Anabasis Alexandri, and so on. They record this has happened. Yes. And that, therefore, they mutinied, and they refused to go further. And Alexander saw it as a loss. And therefore, he had his general uh, Nearchus who, to find the sea route to India, because he, you have to transport an army. You can't transport it easily across desert and mountains. And so he wanted to heavy goods are always transported by sea. So he wanted to have it uh, sent across the sea, so he wanted to find this out. So he wanted to return, because he is an admission of defeat. Yes. And then you, know, you celebrate, oh, he says, uh, Greeks were destined to rule, and India, Asiatics were born to be slaves, and, you know, well, not perhaps born to be slaves, uh, European princess and, uh, uh, you know, Asian handmaiden. Now, what was the state of the British before? So your British governor general was rubbing his nose on the ground in front of Aurangzeb and saying, you know, pleading for mercy after child's fall, because he did not want to, uh, you know, he did not want to annoy, mm -hmm. and they had no military power. Or, for example, after the pirate Avery, he attacked that uh, ship Gunji Savai, 
Aurangzeb's ship and they looted it by some chance because one of the cannons exploded, there was something. So the British parliament declared them enemies of humanity and it hanged 30 of them and they rushed to placate uh, Aurangzeb because they could not fight. Mm -hmm. Because Aurangzeb sent a mission uh, to Surat. Right, yes. So uh, this was their situation. They were literally rubbing their noses on the ground and then see, they have some fantasy history about Alexander and they don't even know the facts. I mean, could William Jones have been so illiterate? Did he not read his Plutarch? Did he not read his Arian? Of course he must have read. Of course he knew about it. So this is a method of rule by fantasy. Right. This is what the church did. See, everything, whatever you're talking about, hell, heaven, uh, all this stuff, uh, you know, virgin birth and so on, it's all fantasy. And that fantasy has power. And this fantasy has power, the Aryan race thesis. Today, you see, there are Dravidians. There's a whole political party. The opposition in Tamil Nadu yes. is also Dravidian. Yes. But how can you have Dravidians if there are no Aryans? And we attribute it to Periyat, but Ambedkar says, what a silly theory, Aryan race theory is. How is it surviving? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, that's, uh, you can't just... So, there is a big problem. So, the fantasy has power. It has the power to create lasting divisions. And... Uh, therefore, this is a technique which he either culturally imbibed or deliberately did using lies to rule. Because lies have power. Yes. Fantasy has power. Right? And that is what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that has to be conclusively broken. Right. And this is one way of doing it, that the Greeks were bad at science. And the proof is that they had a lousy calendar, which was replaced by a Roman calendar, which was still lousy which was lousy till 1582 unless they could borrow from India and correct it. Mm -hmm. And even now it is lousy, the months are gone because if you want to build a calendar, you should have the day right, you should have the month right and you should have the year right. Yes. Right? And, but they can't get it right because they can't get the month right. I mean, months are in complete shambles. You have 28 days in February, you have you know, 30 days, 31 days, 29 days. They have nothing to do with the cycle of the moon. Mm -hmm. So you must relate to the cycle of the moon. Look at the Indian calendar. It has a beautiful thing of Tithi. So 12 degrees between sun and moon when the uh, angle increases, then that is a Tithi. And therefore there are exactly 30 Tithis always in a month. Right. And it correctly gets the cycle from full moon to full moon mm -hmm. because it's 360 degrees. And the tithi may vary, but of course day may also vary, hour may also vary, everything may vary. That's a different matter, that's a problem of Newtonian physics which I'm not getting into. Yes, right. right? So, uh, uh, you have a variation, you have a variation in here and so on, but you should get those things right. Yes. And that requires good arithmetic, because there are not an integer number of days in a month, there are not an integer number of uh, uh, days in a year, there are not an integer number of uh, months in a year. Mm -hmm. And so you must have fractions. Romans didn't have fractions. How do you write a fraction like one by, well, one by four they had, you could have some words. But something more complicated than that, let's say I want to write uh, 365.24 days. Yes. How do I write that in Roman numerals? You can't write it. Right. So that came only with the decimal fractions and the, in India we had fractions. So they did not have fractions and therefore they could not have done that sort of arithmetic. Science requires mathematics. If they don't have fractions, they can't do the most basic science of astronomy. Yes. And therefore they got their calendar wrong because they didn't have the tools for it. And these are things which nobody talks about. So that's what I mean by the arithmetic evidence and the, uh, uh, you know, this is generally what I'm talking about, that they were racist and they were racist because, uh, well, it was all, uh, I mean, the, you have to look at the race association with Greeks that has started with Martin Bernal. Mm -hmm. So if you see the whole idea that the Aryan race, we don't think when you talk of Aryan race, we don't think of Africa. But if you think of Africa, Martin Bernal's point in his Black Athena was that uh, racist historians systematically appropriated Egyptian work to Greeks because uh, Greeks ruled over Egypt, so there were so many translations in uh, Ptolemaic times, and there would have been translations into Greek. Yes. There were translations from Persian, that is recorded uh, in the uh, Persian uh, scriptures, Zoroastrian scriptures. So uh, you have all that record available that they translated and destroyed uh, the Zoroastrian tracts and so on. So those translations took place, but 
they appropriated it all to Greeks because they said that Egyptians are black and white Greeks have to do it. And that is why my article in South Africa, you know, was censored. And I said that Euclid was black, it was a black woman. Mm-hmm. And they could not tolerate it, you know, because that's the point. That's the point I'm making that they're so, they have built up this fantasy to such an extent, they cannot tolerate a counter opinion. Right. They, and it was censored even in India. Censored in South Africa, censored throughout the world, censored in India. So they built up using the Aryan model, they appropriated everything to the Greeks, to the Aryans, because they said only Aryans could do it, blacks could not do it. Right? And strangely enough, there are liberal historians today, the Romila Thapar, your Witzel, and so on, who are uh, celebrating this theory. Mm-hmm. Yes. Why are they racist? And why are they not looking at the because the Aryan race thesis was first formulated by Gobino in defense of slavery. And they hide it. They say Max Muller did it. Max Muller denied it so vehemently. I have the de- so it's falsely attributed. Gobineau did it before the uh, American Civil War and it was used as part of the defense or the moral defense of slavery. I see. Yeah, that it is in uh, consonance with the principles of Christianity. That is what meaning that uh, which accepts uh, blacks as slaves. I see. That's what they meant. And mm-hmm. so I have cited all that which is suppressed by I the see. liberal historians because mm-hmm. they don't want to, you know, uh, face the, this thing of allegation of racism, which they are inheriting. So all this stuff has been suppressed, and now when you bring that out, that uh, this whole Greek glorification was manufactured first during the Crusades, then by racist historians, and of course there's a doctrine of Christian discovery and so on, which has built up a false history of science, and therefore they could not tolerate this, just as the South Africans could not tolerate the idea that Euclid could be a black woman. <laughs> so they cannot tolerate this, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, slightest attack on Greek glorification. Right. And that is why they constructed a counter fantasy. Because the simple trick in science is that if your theory fails, you invent a hypothesis. And if it is not, see, that is what makes it non science. Right? So you go to an astrologer, his prediction fails, he'll invent an hypothesis, it was this call or something happened, and so on and so forth. It goes on like that. Yes. So now if you invent hypothesis, you pile on the hypothesis. The theory is a bad theory because it's not refutable. Yeah. So like, what about dark matter, for example? But uh, I mean, let, let's not get into all the specifics. Point is that if you accumulate hypothesis, it's a failure of the theory. Yes. And this is precisely what they do, that if one fantasy fails, so Greek fantasy fails, they invent another fantasy. Aryan fantasy fails, so, so it's an Aryan invasion. They say, oh, well, you have this Indus Valley civilization and so on. How was there an invasion? Oh, there was a migration. Migration. So, so the, this is moving, jumping from hypothesis to hypothesis. Right. Right. And it's not a more sophisticated form. It's a, it is bad science. And that's why you have to do it. But whichever way you look it, look at it, migration, invasion, you can't counter this arithmetical evidence. Correct, you can't. You just can't do it. Mm. Where was the arithmetic in them? It wasn't, it didn't exist. Where was the calendar? It didn't exist. And then the last part is quite simple, that you are looking at uh, if conquest is a means of spreading language, then they are looking at where is the uh, connection between India and Greece. Mm-hmm. And the simple thing is there's a connection between India and Persia. Persia. So Indian words are, I mean, all so many Hindustani words uh, have a Persian component. Yes. Even today. So that is most natural because you are neighbors. So you speak the same language over such a long period of time. That's right. So that's true also with Avestan. Mm. So no surprise in that. And India extended, you know, up to Gandhar. You have Gandhari in uh, uh, Mahabharata, Mahabharata and yes. so on. So that's not an issue at all. Yes. So that was uh, just adjacent to, the in, to India, Iran. Now you look at Persian conquest of Greek, Achaemenid conquest. Yes. That is an actual conquest which has taken place. It's not a fancy, not an imaginary, you know, some imagined Aryans making an imaginary conquest. Actual conquest. So once that actual conquest takes place, well, you apply the same principles. Conquest means transfer of language, transfer of culture. That's exactly what happened. Except that there are some differences that uh, the Greeks were the external proletariat to not only the Persian civilization, but to the Egyptian civilization. Mm-hmm. And therefore, they copied their gods from Egypt, as Herodotus tells us. I see. Yeah. So that they did, um, their gods are, uh, so you see, what happens is the Persian discontinuity. In India, you have uh, Dev and Asur. Yes, correct. And Asur becomes Ahura, 
there's a transition S to H, which is a simplification. So there's a direction of transmission is outward, mm -hmm. like the direction of arithmetic transmission. Right. So it is outwards. So there need not be a movement of people associated with it, but there's a transmission here. And there's an inversion of good and evil. Yes, now, how can that happen if there is a common thing? They were a common group means they would have a common value. But worse, if you go from Persian to Greek, there is again the dev or dew is the same thing is again good. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how do you account for double inversion? Indeed, yes. Right? Whichever way you trace the root of the Aryans, if they are going to come into India, they have to come from the Khyber Pras. Mm. Right? And uh, the, that means that uh, they should have something, you know, it's not that you invert this side and you invert that side also. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make that sense. is a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can make any fantasy you can pile on. Right. It doesn't make sense. So now they, because they were on the fringes of the Egyptian civilization for a very long time, they got their gods from Egypt. And Herodotus notices it that they did not give up their religion. Mm. They kept on to their religious beliefs, and the beliefs of the Magi are different, and so on and so forth. And he notices that, which is all right, perfectly all right. So they changed the language, and they stuck to their gods. Like if you are talking of Hinduism, you know, you may change the language to English, but you're still stuck with, right? You still hang on to your religious beliefs because they're more deep, they're deeper, more deeply rooted. So that's the thing that you have a simple explanation that uh, Persia conquered Greece. And that's enough to explain the similarity of Persian with Greek. Right, indeed. And the Greek and Latin were the uh, they were Romans were also neighbors of the Persians. Jundis Shapur is where the Roman uh, 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 captured Roman soldiers used to be put, and so on and so forth. I've been yes, there. Yes. And uh, so you have that, and the church had Greek and Latin at its basic holy languages. Right. For the basic texts of the Bible were in that. And so it spread across all of Europe. But there was no Indo-European arithmetic. Correct, yes. So, 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 <laughs> there was no Indo-European arithmetic. Yeah, that's the... So that point has to be emphasized. Right. And I thought that point should come out. And this other point that there is an alternative explanation, which is simplicity itself. They're just neighbors, so they had the same language. That's all. What's great about it? And you take away the Greek glorification and everything. Collapses. Right. OK, so I'm going to I'm gonna uh, yeah. stop it here, because we're running yeah. out of time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Yeah. Raju, for yeah. this exposition. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. OK, right. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Yeah.